Great. Well, it's a, a, a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about um, uh, recent data from clinical trials and new treatments in IgA nephropathy. Um, I'll try to keep it quite brief. There's quite a bit of overlap with um, with John's talk. Um, so, um, so yeah. Uh, so just to give you some general background, as John uh, mentioned before, IgA nephropathy is the most common uh, disease of the filters, the glomeruli. Uh, worldwide, but overall we still consider it to be a rare disease and that's when you put it in context with, for example, diabetes, cancers, heart disease. Uh, and the other thing is that kidney failure will occur in uh, approximately a third of patients, but this happens over a kind of uh, number of years, uh, on average around 20 or 30 years in, in patients who have high uh, degrees of protein leak as well. And I think a combination of these factors, a rare disease that takes several years to develop, uh, really has meant that uh, develop, developing drugs, new drugs in this uh, condition, um, hasn't been the priority for several years, but fortunately um, things are changing and things are changing rapidly. Uh, as John mentioned, there's a number of new exciting treatments now uh, being developed and around the corner. And I'll, I'm going to just touch on a few of these uh, in this talk uh, today. Um, at the moment, our treatment options are limited. Um, so we use ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers uh, to reduce the protein leak as uh, first line treatment. Uh, but really the results of studies of steroids and other agents to suppress the immune system, uh, the, the results from these studies have been inconsistent and we know that there are significant side effects from using these treatments and we have to remember obviously that IG nephropathy uh, is a chronic condition and therefore we have to find treatments that are safe and effective over the long term and not just a short period of time. Um, so one of the uh, strongest links between um, uh, one of the best predictors uh, of um, disease uh, progression disease is the amount of protein that you leak into the, the urine. We know that the risk of progressive kidney disease is particularly high uh, over uh, one gram of protein leak per day. And if we can minimize that protein leak as far as possible, uh, we could slow uh, the rate of progression of the disease. And John has already mentioned the risk calculator, the IG nephropathy network risk score, which is available online, and it allows us to really uh, predict the risk much better for an individual as well. But in these guidelines, these international guidelines that all uh, kidney doctors uh, follow, these are called the KDGO guidelines, which uh, again, Jonathan is the chair of this group uh, that has written these guidelines. Uh, these state that all patients who have more than half a gram uh, of protein leak per day should be treated with one of these uh, treatments, an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker. But when these guidelines were written in 2021, uh, uh, really uh, following that, there have been no uh, good options after giving these treatments. And the first uh, recommendation there was, was to consider enrolment into a clinical trial. So why do we do clinical trials? Uh, if we have a promising uh, therapy, can we just not you know, start using them straight away? Um, well, there's been plenty of examples, I think, in, in medical history of uh, interventions or, or new treatments that were initially thought to be promising uh, that we've later found out have uh, shown to be of no benefit or, or at the worst case scenario, even, even harmful. And we saw, especially, for example, when the COVID-19 pan pandemic uh, started, lots of uh, different treatments were purported to be of benefit and later down the line, through careful work in clinical trials um, really were discounted from use. So we do need reliable evidence of benefits and side effects from new and existing treatments, and also to demonstrate that benefits of new treatments outweigh any risks. And the gold standard of doing this is by doing a randomized controlled trial. So here we take a population of study patients and really we want to match that um, population within the clinical trial as closely uh, as possible uh, to the patients we would like to treat with the new, uh, new medication. Uh, we randomize uh, the study population uh, generally in most trials uh, to uh, half the group 
receiving uh, the, the treatment versus those who receive a control treatment, which is more like a, the standard of care. And these, the control treatment might involve a placebo. And then we follow uh, both groups uh, to look at the outcome. And in IJ diffopathy, that might be reduction of protein leak. It might be changes of kidney function. Um, and really we want to, by randomizing uh, between the two groups, we want to make sure that these, the group receiving the new treatment and the control match each other as closely as possible um, so that any difference in the effect of the treatment can be, uh, uh, a difference in the outcome can be uh, um, correlated to, to the treatment. And, the, and most trials, randomized controlled trials, are done in a double-blinded uh, fashion here. Uh, the patient doesn't know whether they're receiving the active drug or the placebo, and neither does the doctor treating them. And the reason for doing it that way is because we want to minimize as much bias as possible when we're interpreting the outcome of the treatment. And there are a number of phases of doing these clinical trials. So all of these um, 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 phases and the work of clinical trials, uh, there are international standards of doing these in a, in a particular way. Um, so firstly, uh, there's a lot of preclinical work that goes into clinical trials. These could be uh, done in laboratories and, and Leicester uh, takes, uh, uh, does a lot of this uh, preclinical work, looking at, uh, for example, cells uh, in the laboratory, looking at new tr treatments and, and drugs to see whether there could be any effect or, uh, or, or in, uh, that looks promising to take forwards. Once you have that preclinical laboratory work, we move on to phase one studies. This is when we test new drugs in healthy volunteers, human volunteers. These are called first in human trials. And really we're looking at safety, we're looking at dosing and how that drug might be metabolized and processed uh, so we can look, find the optimum uh, uh, combination for that. So that's generally done in about uh, a few, 10 to 30 uh, subjects. Um, the next stage is then to look at that drug in the disease you're looking at. So this is called a proof of concept study. Uh, again, we're looking at dosing and looking more at effectiveness. Does that drug work in that disease and safety as well? Uh, so this could be kind of hundreds of patients in a rare disease like IJ nephropathy. It could be 100 patients or less uh, in that phase two study. And then finally, we have a phase three study, which is this, the phase of study that we do just before a drug is uh, licensed or authorized, and that's called a confirmatory study. And that's when we want to take the findings from the phase two, use that dose, and really look to see, uh, can we replicate those uh, studies in the phase two study in as many people as possible, in uh, as many uh, different groups of patients as possible as well. And, and those studies uh, typically are hundreds to thousands of patients. Again, in IJ nephropathy, we're typically looking at 400, 500 patients globally uh, for those studies. Once a drug is authorised and available for use, it doesn't stop there. We have four, phase four studies or post-marketing uh, studies where we follow people on the new drug to check for long-term safety and effectiveness as well. So in clinical trials, there's a number of considerations. In the UK, uh, all trials of new drugs or new interventions have to be approved by the MHRA, that's uh, the Medicines and uh, um, uh, Health Regulatory Authority. Um, and also a research ethics committee have to approve uh, the protocol as well. And the research ethics committee is made up of uh, expert uh, trialists and also uh, of patients as well. Uh, and they read through the protocol to make sure that everything being asked for in the study would be acceptable um, to do. Um, once that's all approved, then we can conduct the study in the hospital sites and the research team uh, will discuss any new study with you. Um, you will have a chance to read an information sheet about that study and have time to consider that and the chance to ask uh, questions. So if anybody approaches you about a trial, make sure you do ask as many questions as you would like. Uh, and then there is a consent process where you'll be asked to sign a written consent form. And it's really important to note that participation in any clinical trial is completely voluntary. 
Uh, you're free to say no. Uh, you can say no at any point. You don't have to give a reason. And it will not affect the care you've received from your medical team if you decide not to proceed with that. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this uh, for too long. John has already gone through this. Uh, in IgA nephropathy, we have this increase in this uh, particular form of IgA in the circulation that lacks sugar molecules within its hinge region. This is typically found in mucosal secretions normally in the gut, in the respiratory tract, but in, in patients with IgA nephropathy, for some reason, that form of IgA is found at increased quantities in the blood. Um, this drives antibodies towards it that form immune complexes. So we think of IgA nephropathy as being an autoimmune uh, condition. Uh, and those complexes then get stuck in the filters of the kidneys, causing inflammation and kidney damage. And this complement system um, worsens that as well. So uh, focusing on the mucosal uh, system as the source of uh, this form of IgA uh, has been of great interest. And, and here I've just shown a number of drugs really that are in clinical development for the treatment of IgA nephropathy now. So before we had um, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers and steroids. And now you can see over 20 drugs really in development uh, for IgA nephropathy. This again is slightly out of date. Now there are others uh, as well as uh, the ones being investigated here. All of these <laughs> are in clinical trials uh, and the good news is that the ones in green here are already approved for the treatment of IgA nephropathy uh, in um, other countries and are coming to the UK soon as well. So I'm going to touch on each of these classes of medications, starting off with uh, Neficon. Um, uh, this is uh, a, a special form of steroid, targeted release uh, budesonide, which has been packaged in a special starch capsule and it's designed to be released in a portion of the small intestine uh, uh, called the terminal ileum. Uh, and uh, you see the, uh, the, the figure there with the purple um, uh, round patches at the bottom, those are called Peyer's patches. And we believe those are responsible for producing the IgA that we see in IgA nephropathy. Um, so the steroid is released locally there. Um, it's then processed by the liver. So it gets absorbed in the circulation at small quantities and therefore avoids the majority of side effects that we get from steroids. Um, there was a phase two study uh, done and Lester was part of this, uh, showing that this drug could cause uh, large reductions in protein leak and work done by John's group and Karen in the laboratory in Leicester also demonstrated that this drug was able to significantly reduce that harmful production of IgA and also the immune complexes that we see. Uh, that study was then taken forward to a global phase three study and um, earlier this year, it was announced that the, the primary endpoints, uh, the, the, um, uh, that this was a positive study um, in a, in, with this drug able to reduce uh, protein leak significantly, stabilise kidney function. And there's now been two uh, papers published uh, showing that these, this, uh, this drug has been effective up to two years of follow-up. So this drug is approved in the US for use and within Europe. Um, and as John mentioned, there should be a decision by um, the UK uh, 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 authorities um, um, expected in October, and hopefully this drug will be coming soon. Um, what else do we have around the corner? So uh, again, uh, John mentioned these. Uh, there's a, a big interest in targeting the cells that make IgA. So these are B cells. B cells are the cells that are responsible for forming, uh, producing antibodies. Um, and um, uh, there are two um, mediators, messengers, uh, that promote su survival of these cells and also uh, that drive these cells to produce the IgA. Um, so those are called BAF and APRIL. Uh, there are now uh, uh, over five agents that are targeting these. Um, I've listed three here that are in the most advanced stages of development. Uh, first one is called Zikakapat. Um, the second one, Cipropenumab. Uh, they don't make these easy to pronounce. <laughs> and the third, Atakicept. Um, and these are showing really good results in reducing this harmful form of IgA, the galactose de uh, deficient IgA levels. 
by about 60 or 70 percent. Um, significant reductions in protein leak as well. And also the, um, uh, the data that is looking at uh, levels of kidney function, that also looks very promising. Although we only have one year data so far, so that they're slightly earlier in development, but they're looking very promising, uh, these therapies as well. We have to note that these also reduce other um, um, antibody levels as well. Um, but there has been interesting uh, uh, studies looking at the effects of cipropenemab and showing that there is no impact on uh, responses to the COVID vaccine, for example. So uh, very promising treatments and uh, more data to come. Uh, and also to mention uh, that we are currently recruiting to a clinical trial, looking at the, the middle one, cipropenemab, in a phase three global study. Uh, so we are recruiting patients to that trial uh, now in Leicester, and there will be more studies coming through, looking at the top agent and the bottom agent as well, phase three studies uh, around the corner. Uh, complement inhibitors. Uh, so uh, John again mentioned these. Uh, the complement system are an ancient part of our immune system. Um, uh, they target infections in a different way to the antibody system. Uh, they're a group of uh, proteins that are produced in the liver and they help destroy certain uh, organisms or pathogens. But we know in IgA nephropathy that when the IgA gets deposited, um, that that's also recognised by complement and the complement system becomes activated and is a big driver for, for, for promoting inflammation and damage within the kidneys as well. So any ways to try and turn that off, that increased activity off in IG nephropathy would be very uh, desirable as well. Uh, and there's two pathways uh, that are involved, which are called the lectin pathway and the alternative pathway. Now, this is a very complicated diagram, but I only show this really to show uh, the, um, uh, the drugs in blue, which have got codes on them, which really show that there are a number of agents really targeting the complement system at different parts of the pathway. Um, and what's really hoped uh, is that we might be able to, in the future, there's a lot of work going into this at the moment, to see in patients with IgA nephropathy, everybody um, is, uh, has, will have varying degrees of activity of these pathways. Can we look at a pathway that's particularly active in, in a certain individual and target a drug um, uh, to stop that process in that patient? So that's uh, a lot more work to come uh, to look into that. I'm going to mention two of these drugs which are in the latest stages of development. Nalsoplamab is one of them, uh, developed by a company, Omaris, who are based on the west coast of the US. Uh, there were promising uh, studies in a phase two uh, study of 12 patients looking at weekly intravenous infusions of this in terms of large reductions in protein leak and stabilizing kidney function out to three years. And again, we're currently recruiting to a phase three study within Leicester called the Artemis study, looking at this drug. And we are expecting uh, the initial results from this study uh, later on this year. Iptacopan is another uh, uh, drug that targets the alternative pathway. This is a tablet. Um, the phase two studies, again, were show, promising, showing uh, large reductions in protein leak as early as uh, three months into treatment. Uh, there has been a large study, a phase three study, of around 400 patients globally. The applause study that recently completed recruitment. Again, we should be expecting results from this uh, study soon. Uh, so watch your space with complement inhibitors. And lastly, I'm going to touch on non-immune modulators, sparsentan, apsentan, and SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, so um, sparsentan is uh, a, a, a drug that blocks the endothelin system. Uh, hopefully it'll work in combination uh, with the drugs like uh, uh, um, angiotensin receptor blockers. So sparsentin actually has both components within it, an endothelin receptor blocker and uh, uh, an angiotensin receptor blocker, which is similar to those drugs, Ramapril or Lesartan, that, that you, uh, most of you are already on, and they work in a combination way. And uh, results from this study were recently presented in a conference in uh, Thailand, uh, showing that this drug could halve protein leak um, in patients on this compared to standard therapy, which can only reduce protein leak by about 15%, which was a, a very significant result. 
and it led again to the US authorities approving this drug uh, and hopefully we'll get approvals in Europe soon for this to be added to our um, uh, uh, treatment um, uh, armamentarium. We in Leicester have conducted a study, again looking at this drug, um, in patients newly diagnosed with IgA nephropathy um, involving five uh, uh, sites in the UK, really looking at how this drug works uh, in patients with repeat, um, uh, repeat kidney biopsies, uh, an MRI scan to look at the degree of scarring, um, other measurements as well, um, and we'll be presenting these results, which look very good, in the conference coming up in a few weeks' time. Uh, another drug that's related to that is called Atrocentan. Um, again, this study has recruit, uh, completed recruitment of over 400 patients globally, uh, and we should expect results from that study uh, next year as well. Uh, and I'll move on from SGLT2 inhibitors because John's already uh, talked about those as well. Finally, I'm going to just mention about the gut. I know there's a lot of interest in, in, in the questions earlier on. We do believe that the majority of IgA and IgA nephropathy is coming from the gut as the primary source. Uh, and we're very interested in how the production of IgA by the gut mucosal immune system might be influenced by the microbiome. Uh, there's a huge amount of my interest in the microbiome uh, in many diseases at the moment. These are, uh, this describes really the bacteria and the organisms that live within the gut as, as your healthy kind of bacteria, but are there any changes in IgA nephropathy that influence it to pr produce this increased amounts of harmful IgA that we can see? And can we target that uh, in a way to redu reduce IgA production? Um, there are mouse studies, there's been human genetic studies that have highlighted a link between the gut um, and uh, IgA production and IgA nephropathy. Um, we have seen a new treatment in IgA nephropathy, this targeted release steroid uh, that looks beneficial as well. Um, so we are conducting this uh, study uh, of looking at probiotics to see if we can influence the production of IgA in a beneficial way in IgA nephropathy as well. Uh, looking at this probiotic, which is uh, very well tolerated, you can actually buy this in a health food shop, uh, but we're interested in, in seeing if we can see any beneficial changes in IgA nephropathy. This, this will involve three months on the study, uh, on the probiotic and three months off the probiotic. Uh, we're looking for adult patients with a GFR above 45, and the reason for looking at that is because we know that people with more advanced stages of kidney disease less than 45, that that can influence the microbiome itself. So if anybody is interested, please uh, uh, do uh, get in touch with Justina, who's in our audience as well. So how do you find out more about clinical trials? Um, the first step I would suggest is to contact your kidney doctor, your kidney unit. Um, they'll know what's going on in your local centres and obviously we are available as well uh, and we'll be able to uh, uh, point you in the right direction of uh, any clinical trials that might be happening uh, closely to you. Um, there are certain websites that you can look at as well. Um, the first one is a UK website, the next two are US-based websites, but also have information about trials going on in the UK. Uh, this first one is called Be Part of Research. Um, you can type in um, the disease you're looking at, IgA nephropathy, and your address, and it should show uh, the trials that are recruiting near to you and, and um, um, kind of some of the inclusion criteria that, criteria that we're looking at. Um, it's not always fully up to date, but so it is a good idea to still talk to your kidney team about trials. Um, this is the Nefcure uh, Kidney Health Gateway uh, website as well. Again, you can type in the condition and your address uh, and clinicaltrials.gov, which is slightly, um, can be slightly more difficult to read, um, but they have revamped this website recently. Uh, and again, you can look at the currently recruiting trials near you. And the great news is obviously that the research uh, field is extremely active in IgA nephropathy at the moment. There are 170 studies going on worldwide in IgA nephropathy. You can see the majority in China uh, where, uh, and in Asia where IgA nephropathy is very common, really. Um, but it's also spread globally. Some of these are drug uh, trials of, um, that are sponsored by 
pharmaceutical companies. Some of these are more university-led studies, but the research um, really has uh, is very active in our university as well. So to summarise then, uh, the treatment landscape is rapidly changing um, and hopefully uh, we'll have many uh, new therapies coming, uh, uh, but the ability to do that does depend on uh, recruiting successfully to these clinical trials. Um, we have two uh, treatments that are specific for IgA nephropathy uh, that have already been mm. approved as well. But there are several uh, questions still. Um, how do we treat IgA nephropathy best in children? How do we treat uh, people with IgA nephropathy who have more advanced stages of kidney disease, those with an EGFR below 30? How do we treat um, uh, kidney, uh, IgA nephropathy that occurs after a kidney transplant? Um, how do we treat uh, patients best who have that rapid decline in kidney function that uh, Professor Barrett was uh, mentioning before, um, who, where kidney function is dropping in days to weeks? And how do we best treat this related form uh, of disease, IJ vasculitis? Um, so I'm going to stop there. And uh, thank you for your attention. Do we have time for questions, Racy? Yes. Um, hi there. I, I just have a couple of um, um, hopefully quick questions just to, to see if I've understood it correctly. Um, so when um, John talked about um, combination uh, coming through in the next five to ten years, is that time scale related to the fact that you've got to go back through clinical trials of the combination? Or is that something else? Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting question. I think it's a question that's being asked a lot at the moment because there are all these different drugs being developed. Um, really, we do need trial evidence to look at combinations of treatments just to make sure that they are safe to be used together. But those trials are happening. For example, the combination of um, endothene and receptor blockers and SGLT2 inhibitors um, that we, you know, was touched on before those combination trials are happening. I think we do need to see the results of, you know, looking at one drug first, and then and then once we see, hopefully, that that is beneficial, then we can look at combinations later on. Okay, and then it's a, it's a kind of similar question in a way, but from a patient's point of view, is it um, possible slash encouraged to combine trials? So if you're already on one trial, is it possible to have that combined with a second trial? So a lot of the trials at the moment will prohibit that because obviously um, um, within the protocol, we would be looking at the effects of one medication and, what, and, and there will be certain drugs that are not allowed to be used at the same time. And, and sometimes they will exclude other investigational drugs as well because really we want to see the effect of one drug uh, 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 and it's very difficult when you add another drug with an unknown quantity into that mix. Um, so, yeah. It, sorry, the, 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 the specific one I was thinking of there is the, the very last one, I think it was that you mentioned, um, where you're three months on probiotic, three months off probiotic, yeah. Yeah. Um, linked with a, another trial. And whether, I guess, given the safe, I, I'm, I'm thinking from yeah. a layman's point of view, that the safety of that is probably less of an issue. Yes, yeah, it's less of an issue, but um, I think for the probiotic study, we wouldn't be taking people on other investigational uh, trials because we're looking at the effects on the IgA immune system and it could be influenced in other ways, for example. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, I have to say, you know, it does look like quite a slow process. And I, I understand, you know, from a patient's point of view, that, you know, you just want answers and very quickly. But we've seen, you know, in, in the COVID 19 pandemic, how quickly things can move if everybody is focused on, on research and recruiting to start trials quickly. We saw uh, innovative trial design, combination trials as well. So you know, things uh, we are always looking at more efficient ways of uh, designing clinical trials to try and get to those answers as quickly as possible. <laughs> okay. uh, I've seen several trials that uh, only include people who had a biopsy within 10 years and I've always wondered why what's what's wrong with those of us who've had biopsies before that 
It's a good question. I think, you know, the 10 years does feel a bit arbitrary. I think there's always discussions with the people who design studies. And I know John is uh, on several of these committees where kind of experts get together and decide when a cutoff should be. There are some trials where we can only take people who've had a biopsy within a few years, uh, others where there's no time limit as well. I think um, so it depends really on the specific drug that we're looking at and how we think that's going to impact on, uh, on, on the condition as well. But yes, I'll take your point. Um, just a quick question about the NICE approvals. Um, two or three times this morning is what it said. It's gone through FDA in the US and NICE is coming soon. Um, I know you can't be specific, but what does that generally mean? Um, so uh, NICE is a, um, uh, a kind of organisation within the NHS that's been set up uh, to look at, um, at the cost effectiveness and whether the NHS can afford to fund new treatments as a way of um, reimbursement of new treatments as well. So they have to look at all the data and make that kind of cost value judgment as well. So there's a meeting, I think it's in the start of October, where they're going to all sit down and, and look at all the analyses that's been provided by the company and decide that, you know, will it be available for all patients or specific uh, uh, groups of patients with with ideal so that's that's the process that's taking um, place and on the couple here where fda have had approval and it's available in the us what's your best guess in terms of when nice and it might be available in the uk i think it should be imminent after october if it all goes well and you know we're hoping because obviously the drug has been approved in other countries that it will be approved here as well thank you where can you find the nice, uh, yeah, the nice, there should be a kind of, I mean, it's all public, you know, there is a, a website, nice, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, and it is, there are, um, all the documents are available available publicly. So if you typed in the drug, I think Neficon or Budes maybe Budesonide and nice, you would see all the discussions taking place and there will be a decision after that, yeah. Um, do you want to ask that? Go ahead. Um, so in these new drugs, Will there be a cutoff point in terms of GFR? Like anyone under a certain point, would there, you know, would there be a cutoff? There? Yes, I think as John mentioned before, um, generally when these drugs are licensed and approved, they do match um, what has been studied in the trials, just because the evidence is there. I think the companies are, are usually keen to look at their drugs in a wider group as possible. Um, so there can be follow-on studies potentially looking at wider groups, but generally they do tend to match what was studied in the first place and where the evidence is. Um, so let's just say a drug was approved in October by NICE. Um, how quickly then does do the local renal teams, you know, how quickly can they prescribe it to their patients? Because obviously they need to be informed, they need to know the guidelines. In Leicester, it probably happens immediately. Other places, it might take longer. It is a process um, and it does involve, you know, practical things, just getting the supply, getting the drug into the pharmacy, having a local process as well. Um, I think generally it does take another about two or three months for that process to happen. Uh, and. Um, you know, we've had new drugs come through recently for vasculitis for lupus, and that is the rough time scale that, that it does take. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I suppose the, the gut question, I know it came up earlier, do you see more prevalence of gut-related um, or related um, issues, whatever, in IgAM patients as well? Yeah, I think not in everybody, but there are links between celiac disease and IgA nephropathy. There are links between inflammatory bowel disease and IgA nephropathy. So not in everybody, but in certain, you know, there are uh, stronger uh, correlations that, than you might uh, expect. Uh, um, so um, there does seem to be that, that, that link. 
not a question. I just want to say thank you because I was diagnosed 19 years ago and I was just told to take control my blood pressure and wait till my kidneys failed. So to have this is, you know, yeah. amazing. Really so thank you. That's good. I think, I mean, it's the, it has changed and that really we've witnessed a change over the last five years and it is a global effort. But I think it does start in the laboratories, you know, that painstaking work that takes place over several years to find that kind of proof of concept and then bringing these through. So the work, for example, for this drug that hopefully will be approved soon in the UK, I think, you know, the work on that drug has been a good say seven eight years in the in, in the making really great thanks some of the drugs that are presented tonight for approval are eye-wateringly expensive does that generally reflect the cost of the development of the drug or is it sometimes drug companies trying it up <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> I mean, I do think, you know, obviously the, the costs of developing a drug are huge. And for every drug that makes it, there are several others that don't. Um, but the, but that's the reason why there's nice to try and, you know, protect as well and, and, and to have that negotiation and discussion as well. John, you're going to comment. How much do you think it costs per drug that gets to market? How much, how much does it cost? For a, for a, so for every new drug, if you work out how many drugs have failed, how much it took, how much do you think a new drug has cost to develop? Ten, yeah, yeah, yeah. a new yeah. plus. Yeah. One to two billion. Oh, wow. Two billion. Yeah. wow. A phase three study costs that hundred million to deliver, mm -hmm. and that's just one aspect. That's taking into account all the drugs that fail and all the work that's gone in. So that's how much it costs to bring drugs to market, on average. 